Okay, welcome back. Hi, and I'm very pleased to have joined me today uh, an illustrious panel. Um, we have uh, three people I think are all uh, leaders in the institutional space in what is going on in digital assets and digital securities uh, right now. Very pleased to have them join us this morning. I'll let them do a little bit of introduction in a moment. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, what's going on in uh, digitization of assets in financial services right now. So I have Emmanuel Edu, who's the Head of Digital Assets from Credit Suisse, Angie Walker, who's the Head of Business Development and Capital Markets for R3, one of the leading tech providers of DLT technology, and Abradat Kamalpour, uh, from Ash a partner at Ashurst, leading in the uh, fintech and digital security space. Uh, so welcome to all of you. Maybe I'll let you just uh, expand a little bit on, on yourselves and uh, your roles and we'll take it from there. So start maybe over, over to you, Emmanuel. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Emmanuel Adi. I'm over at Credit Suisse. I'm the uh, head of digital asset markets, as Anthony said. Um, I've been at the firm, oh, I'm aged myself, uh, 23 years now. Uh, I'm a software engineer by background. Um, spent most of my time in, in roles like uh, Leverage Finance Europe, Leverage Finance uh, Globally, Debt Capital Markets. I got to the blockchain arena um, in around about 2014 uh, and, and completely fell in love with the space, um, really focusing uh, CS's efforts over the course of the last five years or so, uh, focusing CS's efforts and strategy on all things blockchain, all things digital assets. Moved over to the uh, electronic execution uh, business within equities uh, at the beginning of last year um, to really start building out the business practice. I think one of the, one of the first major investment banks to do so. Glad to be here. Thank you. Uh, Angie? Yeah, um, good afternoon or good morning for those who are joining from the US. Uh, my name is Angie Walker. I'm uh, Head of Business Development Capital Markets for R3. I joined R3 just under three years ago. It feels like a lifetime ago because a lot's happened in the last three years. It moves very fast. I've spent... Um, uh, last 28 years in capital markets. Um, so a large proportion of that in the front and the middle office providing and building uh, very complex trading platforms. So having lived within a very small world of asset classes, primarily equity and listed derivatives, um, coming to R3 and the work we're doing and the innovation we're doing within capital markets in R3 and with the ledger has uh, broadened my horizons dramatically to a much broader range of asset classes that we're working with and the life cycle uh, and the workflows that we're working with today. So it's a very exciting time. Um, I'm very privileged to be involved in all of it and uh, delighted to be with you today. Thank you, Angie, glad you could join us. And uh, last but not least, uh, Abrida. Thank you very much, Anthony. It's a pleasure to be on the panel with uh, uh, yourself, Emmanuel and Angie. Uh, I'm a partner at Ashurst in London. I'm in the finance practice. I also head at the firm's um, accelerator program, FinTech Legal Labs. My uh, practice history has been in capital markets, financial products, and innovative structures around financial products. In my early career, I was also involved with a number of startups and startup projects in the financial services industry. So I've had a good background in sort of marrying sort of innovative um, technologies and uh, sort of capital markets, actually. And, and have had a massive focus on how we can actually use and take advantage of current technologies, particularly on blockchain in the digital asset space. Um, and have seen some really amazing projects come up actually, including Onera. There we go. Thank you, uh, Abradat. And uh, maybe just very briefly, I'll give you uh, the shortest background to, to how uh, I ended up at Onera as well. So um, I've had a long career in uh, capital markets, uh, working for large institutions, uh, amongst them uh, City many years, HSBC, Sogen, and uh, really through a long time in my career where we were using leading edge technology to uh, bring electronic trading uh, to the fore in areas such as uh, FX and fixed income. Um, and then I think it was for 2014-15, much uh, like my panel here, uh, started to get really interested in what was going on at the time with uh, blockchain, smart contracts, and the impact that that was. We felt that was going to have in uh, financial services. Uh, so uh, it gets to a point when you work with uh, this space, you work with a lot of fintechs, it becomes a bit addictive. And uh, last year, I uh, started understanding what Onera is doing, really believing in that vision around the private markets, and so joined them at the beginning of uh, this year. 
Um, and I think what you'll find is that there are, you'll see many people in the institutional world who are really driven change in financial services in their careers moving into this space because we can see that this is where really things are happening now and this is the big next transformational step. Okay, so um, we have uh, half, just over half an hour um, to cover some interesting topics. Um, maybe where I'll start in our discussion, I, I gave the presentation I gave previously, I, I referenced COVID-19. We really can't have any conversation without making reference to these very unique times that we are in this year. Um, and I think it's, it's, you know, people are really just starting to, uh, to understand how it's transforming our societies and our economy in so many ways. Um, so it's, uh, dare I say, it's often said, uh, you know, a crisis is maybe a catalyst for change. Um, I wonder for my uh, panel members here, how, how do you see, how's the way the, the pandemic really affecting the way large institutions are thinking about, the, are, they, are they only looking at the, the, the downside or are they looking at the opportunities maybe presented by digital assets and uh, digital transformation more broadly? Uh, maybe I'll go to you, Emmanuel, for, the, for that one first. How, how's the world changed the last six months for you guys? I think it's a good question, right? And we always have to stop and think about how, you know, outside factors are affecting us um, and, and, our, and our outlook. And, and I'll tell you, I think when the uh, pandemic kind of first hit, I remember talking to um, some peers at other banks and, you know, in March, and we pretty much uh, concluded that we could write off 2020. I mean, I think going into 2020, um, we were probably feeling like 2020 was going to be our year. Um, and digital assets were going to lift off. Well, I think my job is to be the optimist. <laughs> and that was probably overly optimistic. Uh, in any case, with, with or without COVID is kind of the answer. I think that um, I, I'm happy that we, I haven't seen a slowdown in our in energy enthusiasm interest in the space at, at CS, any back credits with. And actually even not even with the, in the projects and consortiums that we're in as well. And it probably just meant that um, my uh, uneasy feeling was likely uh, driven from a bit of optimism, over-optimism that 2020 was going to be the landing year, because it's likely not. Um, there was still some really important building blocks uh, that needed to happen. Um, people, uh, both on the buy side as well as on the sell side, need to have a better understanding of what digital assets are. Projects like the one that you are doing with FinP2P uh, needed to be established um, there, there were still so many fundamental building blocks needed for us to get to the kind of scale that that's needed to tipping to the, for that hockey stick. Um, so I actually ultimately think that this year has been actually really good. We've actually had um, some good success in terms of building fundamental building blocks um, that, that are needed um, to build a robust ecosystem supporting digital assets. Very good. And um, what about uh, Angie? I know uh, our three, we are, you've got your main office in London, beautiful offices, but uh, they're probably a bit empty at the moment. But uh, how, how are you seeing? I mean, you, you talk to, you have a, uh, you know, the, probably a, a luxurious position of talking to many different players in the industry, banks, FMIs, other tech providers, etc. How you, how's this really Im impacting things the last six months? Yes, I am very fortunate in that I do get to see a very diverse range of projects that are ongoing within capital markets thank goodness i don't have to worry beyond capital markets because i think it would i would drown um i think there's a number of areas we're seeing significant change uh i think well listen one of the unintended consequences of of covid is that it's created these extreme conditions in which we are living and and for some that's brought in tremendous adversity as you can appreciate and particularly within you know, the corporate world, I can't start to imagine some of the challenges that small and large organizations are facing and how they uh, try to strategically drive their business forward against the backdrop of such incredible extreme circumstances. But in other cases, it's, of course, uh, accelerated growth beyond anybody's expectations. And so you have these incredible extremes that we're witnessing. And what that's actually done, and again, you're probably seeing this with the projects you're working on at the moment, uh, Anthony, we've seen a massive increase in the uh, appetite for capital formation uh, across a number of the initiatives that, that, that we're involved with that are being built on quarter. And that's really because 
It's either people want to be able to sweat an asset or lease capital or raise capital because they are witnessing either extreme downturns in their revenues and their growth or extreme acceleration in revenue growth. So what one of the unintended consequences or inadvertent effects of COVID is it has created these incredible extremes. So I'd certainly say in the world of capital formation and, and, and raising of capital, we've definitely seen a massive increase in appetite. And that's not just within um you know sort of uh, uh the the larger corporates it's also within the smaller industries and the and the micro uh the micro sort of economic uh areas as well the really sort of small entrepreneurial sectors as well so definitely changes there and i'd also say we're seeing some big changes in in transformations you know not just in areas like post-trade but also in other parts of the existing life cycle to try and drive much greater efficiency much greater transparency because people recognize which we're going to be facing a lot of challenges going forward and we have to be much more efficient we have to be much more transparent and we're seeing that a lot uh, within uh, a lot of the life cycles that live there today the legacy life cycles and how we can leverage the ledger and the digital representation of assets existing assets to drive much greater efficiency and post trade is a really good example of that and i'd say the other thing is that people are looking at how they manage things like cash and collateral because against the backdrop of the increasing obligations for collateral like UMR, we have to be much more efficient about how we manage our cash and our collateral. And again, the mobilization through the use of uh, asset digitization, cash representation of cash in a tokenized form or collateral in a tokenized form, and this ability to mobilize it with much uh, greater cadence, you know, moving uh, cash and collateral, you know, uh, in, almost instantaneously, which of course we couldn't do in the past, is again really important to optimizing the assets we have and making them as as powerful as we can possibly make them. So I think it's having some really um, diverse but very positive impacts on the adoption of tokenized assets and, and, and DLT industry wide, which is very promising actually. Yes, indeed. I think, you know, with, with private companies, you're now seeing the, the, the extremes, as you say, right? I mean, you know, this terrible crisis, I think, you know, there are private companies that have been put under test that maybe might not make it through through the crisis, but there are many that uh, either have, have, you know, been profitable, grown organically for many years, find themselves needing financing through no fault of their own great, strong companies. And you see the companies, as you say, they're really taking off the um, their markets uh, are, are really growing exponentially as a, as a byproduct of what's what's going on at the moment. In all these cases, they're they're all looking, uh, and many are looking for for financing or, or in different ways, um, and many of them also probably looking for lawyers as well, right? After that, um, how, how how have you how's things with you guys right well, now? At Chess? It's, it's quite interesting actually, Anthony, because I don't. There was after the initial lockdown phase, I would say there was a slight slowdown in communication. Um, by sort of projects that were sort of kicking off. But actually, it's come really full steam ahead. I mean, we've seen it both on the institutional side and the startup side, actually. You see clients like Goldman Sachs announcing that there's a new head of blockchain, and that's during this lockdown period. So that shows the institutional support. Um, we've just been instructed uh, recently by a very significant group on the development of two... Um, uh, cryptocurrency projects, which I think when they come live are going to ha have a serious impact in the market. So I've that's on the institutional side. And in terms of the startup world, you know, we we opened the fintech legal labs formally for applications two weeks ago. Uh, when you're you're an advisor on that lab uh, from your SG days and and continue to be, and uh, amazingly we've had close to 65 applications in a two week period. And um, that shows you that, that there is still, and a lot of those applica applicants are very high quality and are actually active in this space. Not all of them, because it's not purely a blockchain-based accelerator, but there's a big component of that. So I, I, I think that there is still momentum. There's still a lot of interest. People are recognizing that you know, they want to have access to their assets in, and currencies in digital form more than they did before. And I, I just don't see a slowdown in it. Um, whether we're going to see digital assets sort of be accepted more broadly, I, I don't, I can't give you a timeline on that. That could be very quickly, or it could just take some time. But it's no doubt going to happen. Yeah, indeed. Uh, I think the uh, 
this this whole excitement this world that the words getting out a little more, bit more broadly i think uh, you know we had uh, jay clayton the chair of the sec commenting last week he, he's realized he's thinking maybe all stocks might become tokenized over time uh, which you know it's quite a quite a revelation um but what i say uh, you know i joke slightly but you know does this uh, for you guys does this when you talk to senior executives c-suite this sort of thing do you, is is that awareness there as well do you think well that the organizations are waking up to to this so i would say pockets are and pockets are still sort of learning um there's no doubt that the governments and regulators are very aware of it. I mean, you probably saw there was recently, just recently, 24th of September, you know, the, the, the EU sort of came out with its digital finance strategy and proposed laws around that, including, um, you know, uh, a market in crypto <laughs> assets, right? So um, the regulators are well aware of it. And they are because there's a lot of institutions, uh, you know, submitting proposals and saying, look, we need these changes in law to be able to accommodate such things. Uh, and, you know, we're going to have new asset classes that are going to come out other than the traditional. But I, but I actually agree with that observation that, you know, we're going towards this path of tokenization um, as a term, could be called something else, but that is the path we're going down. There's no doubt about it. And everyone, everyone in the market that I speak to is generally aware of it or learning about it. And uh, Emmanuel, I know, I know you worked this out about six years ago, right? I remember us having conversations back in uh, 2015. But uh, what about the uh, senior executives of Credit Suisse? Is, uh, is that message getting through? Yeah, I wouldn't just speak about them. I, I think I spend a lot of time with, with our big clients as well. And, and I think um, Jabradat's point that they're still a learning. And I think people have to figure out what, it, what do we mean? by digital asset in the first place. What do we mean by tokenization? For many of us, I think, um, you know, they, they look at the world we live in today, which is electronic, and they confuse electronic with digital. They, they confuse, um, you know, book entry with digital, and they say, well, what's the difference? And I think sometimes you have to go back to basics. You have to go back to where we are and how do we get here? And, and um, it, I kind of tend to look at this as the part in the kind of the three tranches of the past, the present and the future. And, and you, you have to evoke kind of the imagery of what would it have been like to um, facilitate trading in the pre-electronic, i.e. pre-compute. You have to go back very far. You have to go back prior to 1993. In fact, let's, why don't we go back to the 1970s and think about what it was like on Wall Street or on... Um, or down in um, the city of London, and how were trades actually facilitated then? And for some of us might, I'm not old enough to remember that, by the way, um, I got it here just at the advent when, when desktop compute was coming in. Um, but some people in the call on listening in might remember that, right, in terms of um, bikes and, uh, and couriers and signatures and all that good stuff. And, and so when you, it's not all that long ago that that was the way that we did things. It was slow, it was expensive, there were lots of mistakes. And then we get to the point in the, I would say, mid to late 90s, certainly the mid 90s when desktop compute, um, if we think about the, in, the first wave of internet, which is about connectedness, is late 90s and, and certainly early 2000s. So again, not that long ago in the big scheme of things. And when we look at our infrastructure, this is when we become electronic, this is when we become book entry. This is the phase we're in now. And so one of my very first roles when I started in, on, on the street was in a, a company called DLJ, which you might remember was bought by Credit Suisse. And, you know, we wrote systems at the time uh, that did trade entry. Uh, and, and so that means we wrote systems, I wrote a system that um, automated the seven steps that the, that the trader was cared about. You know, he was taking himself of a paper blotter and he'd heard about this thing called desktop compute. And he hired a, a smart Englishman called Emmanuel Aidy to go and cr to create a trade entry system for him. And then the middle office person uh, maybe someone like Angie hired their own person to do the next few steps in that process. And maybe the finance control person, a product control person hired an IT person to automate the p and per process. And then pretty much 20 years later, you end up with 3000 systems across eight different products, all connected via either messaging protocols um, or, or FTP files or wherever, how we're sending messages. And that's the mess we're in today. <laughs> we're reconciling across systems where logic has been uh, 
applied and interpreted in different ways. And that's what we're trying to unbundle with a digital asset. And the digital asset is an asset where we've got a, um, a single understanding of the term sheet and a single understanding of you know, how the rules, the regulatory rules applied to that term sheet in terms of its accounting standard or, the, or its transfer rights, et cetera. And, and we believe fundamentally, everyone on this call, as I know, that what we saw happen when we, when, when we went electronic, which is that it became much more efficient and we went from some price to zero to transfer security and the volume went up massively. That's the benefit of electronic. Um, but we, we stalled at two days. Um, now what will happen in this, uh, in this scenario is we're gonna get to instant, we're gonna get to 24 by seven and the cost of compliance, the cost of regulation the, and the operational risk associated with everything we built over the last few years has got to, is gonna disappear. That message, to your point, took me a long way to get there, but that message I don't think has completely sunk in and resonated with every senior executive in a leadership position across not just my firm, but others. Because if they did, then they, 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 I think digital assets wouldn't be something that was scary, unknown. It would be just the next iteration of securities. And I'm not saying that there aren't uh, opportunities to um, develop new parts of the cap structure that we haven't thought about yet using uh, virtual um, cryptocurrency parlance, but th th there's, there's enough wood to chop, um, simplifying the internal banking, that, banking stack using digital assets um, that we can focus on that. Chewed up quite a bit of time there, but hopefully that was useful. No, I think it's really important to, to have that historical context and think about the bigger picture because I think sometimes you've got either people who have just been in the, the, the world, this world of transformation the last few years, and think everything's changing tremendously fast and don't have the awareness of the world that was. You've got those of us that maybe uh, have been through tremendous transformation in uh, capital markets and financial services industry maybe 20 years ago. I mean, I remember when uh, uh, looking at a trade floor, rows of spot traders individually hedging euro dollar spot trades. And uh, we implemented a system at a, a big American bank. Uh, I won't mention here, well, it was a fantastic program, FX Auto Trader, right? And it did what it said on the tin. I think by the time we finished the project, you had uh, uh, far fewer spot traders and someone managing currency inventory uh, and flattening their inventory in, in real time. And I think it's that balance of living through change. And then you've got lots of people in the financial service industry that think things aren't changing because they wake up tomorrow and it looks like the same as it did today. It's like looking at the minute hand of the clock. Plus, as you, as you say, we're sitting on 30 years of uh, tech legacy in that space. But I think, you know, the transformation that we saw in capital markets 20 years ago, we think of wholesale banking more broadly, not just in terms of the public secondary markets, but what is going in the primary markets, both on the private side, and then the IPOs that aren't happening so much now on the public side, you start to see the opportunity for the whole life cycle of those those financial products those securities right not just that that public secondary trading which we will think about when we think about technology in this industry um i don't know if you had anything to to add to that uh angie i know you you've uh obviously you haven't lived through quite as much of this in, uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, over the years but uh i joke but no i mean for yourself you you came through a fmi background i mean do you, do you, what's your perspective on those transformations yeah, I actually came most of my life I spent um, on the equities trading OMS side. So yeah. it's really interesting to hear Emmanuel's story because I came from the period when we went from blotters and writing orders on blotters and handing them to sales traders and all of that being very manual to, you know, as, as electronically executing baskets of 3000 orders in less than five seconds or two seconds or eventually sub one second and and obviously doing things like low latency trading in, in, in microseconds. So I've seen the whole gambit from beginning to end only in the front and middle office. Um, I think the Jay Clayton thing is really interesting. I think it, it represents a really quite a significant change in sentiment. I don't want to speak uh, out of turn, but I've witnessed in the last probably nine months a really different attitude amongst the national competent authorities within the various jurisdictions. You've seen some really big changes, I'm sure Abadak could tell you in much better detail than I can, but they represent a sentiment change across the regulators. And the problem is, is within our industry, the reality is, and particularly amongst the FMIs where I spend a large proportion of my time today, 
you know, they're very highly regulated. They, they, by their very nature, they are quite rightly so deeply conservative, very risk averse. And without the regulators embracing um, the use of tokenization and digital representation of assets, um, and without them uh, embracing or at least acknowledging the use of the ledger uh, for uh, institutional type activities, um, the FMIs were never really going to sort of go on the journey with any great scale until the regulators were actually sort of giving them the so-called thumbs up. Now, what is interesting is in that um, European Commission's strategy, one of the four main priorities, which I was absolutely delighted to see, was that they want to see the regulators um, and the regulatory frameworks in which we all live and exist every single day to become much more um, embracing of the use of DLT. And I was very pleased to see that because as you well know, the regulators won't mandate the use of technologies. That's not what they're there to do. And they're very open about that. Um, but without them actually recognizing the use of asset digitization and tokenization and the use of the ledger, it was very difficult even for the most innovative of exchange groups and CSDs and CCPs and market infrastructure providers to really drive innovation. Now I've seen a big change. I don't know what everybody else feels in this group, but in the last six months, we've seen some of the coldest of regulators <laughs> really start to feel much more um, motivated and, uh, and uh, collaborative around the use of digitization, tokenization of assets and the use of the ledger. And that's really good news for everybody in our industry. We're seeing some very radical transformations now in the way that we're using tokenization to do things like fractionalize very large in scale, esoteric assets such as real estate and infrastructure and, and even things as uh, wacky and a lot out, out there as fine art, racehorses, football players, you, you name it, they're doing it. I mean, anything that's got a value that can be shared across a broader audience uh, in, in a digital form um, makes it available to a much wider community. And the fractionalization creates democratization, as you know, and that's really good news because then we're opening the door to much broader communities of investors institutionally. I'm, I haven't even gone beyond that. Um, so that's a very important element. And the use of the ledger to share that data, you know, a single version of the truth in the same way that we do with limit or open limit order books, you know, lit markets are all about a single version of the truth. We're looking at the order book. We're looking at those um, market orders that we should be able to execute against. And so the ledger does the same thing is it, it provides a single version of the truth in relation to an asset and an asset's life cycle, which is fantastic news for the market because it broadens the accessibility to those assets, either in their raw form or in their fractionalized form. But it also means that, that, that we all look at one version of the truth. And, and, and if it, ever that was needed, and, uh, and the manual again alluded to that with this, with the, with this incredible complexity uh, around the market structures and around the infrastructure that we run, uh, individually uh, by having a single version of the truth across a whole market, across a whole asset class and a, and a whole uh, group of people who are working together within that group asset class will make uh, for vast simplification and reconciliation, you know, could well be eventually a thing of the past because the more of those life cycles that are condensed onto the ledger, the less the use for reconciliation will ever exist in, in many of these life cycles because you can't reconcile something that every, everybody's looking at if it's the same thing. So one version of the truth, one immutable record, one trusted ledger, which is immutable and secure and has complete privacy. And we can do some very transformational things. And we now seem to have uh, the regulators really starting to come on side and recognizing the benefits of that. So I'm very happy with all of that and, and, the, and the sentiment and the change over the last few months. Yeah, I think you have to work within uh, large institutions or have done to uh, um, have seen hundreds of operations staff doing a uh, reconciliation, dealing with breaks and fails and all of that complexity that goes with it. Um, you, you referenced uh, alternative asset classes a moment ago. It's interesting because you're focused on capital markets. I think historically that's been shorthand for public capital markets. Um, but actually, you hear people saying that more now because there's an understanding that we're opening up the private capital markets as well. Uh, and you're, you're, I guess you're looking across that whole spectrum. So where do you see it having the biggest impact or, or how do you see that proceeding in terms of transformation of traditional, say, securities, equity in, their, in, the, in the public markets versus 
the equity and debt in the private markets and then alternative assets. I mean, how, how do you see, where do, where do you see that playing out with the, the biggest impact uh, in over time, Angie? So I think on the, I think in terms of the equity markets, I think there's going to be a big impact, particularly in the small cap, the micros and the private equity marketplace. I think the use of the uh, representation of those assets in the digital form, the fractionalization of them uh, in itself could bring greater liquidity. So if you think about the small cap markets where we really struggle with liquidity, I mean, I come from an equities world and and within those small cap markets and the micro markets, it's very difficult to create liquidity by fractionalizing that in itself creates greater liquidity um, because you're moving much more the units. So I think within private equity, there is a, an increased demand for more um, favorable and more uh, diverse ways of raising capital and the use of, again, uh, tokenization of uh, and digital representation of private um, equities and making those assets available to be invested in by a much broader community, which the legend is uh, allows us to do within a very uh, secure Could I, could I jump in for one quick second? Sorry. Yeah. I, I, you mentioned something, Angie, that I want to just uh, ask a question and maybe to Aberdat on this, um, which is I, I haven't yet been convinced that just because you fractionalize something, it makes it liquid um, because the asset itself has got to be something people actually want. And that, that want drives a liquidity. And the second thing is, and this is the Aberdeck part, have the regulators had any opinion that, you know, an asset that today is, you know, institutional only because it's uh, illiquid, uh, let's say it's a, it's a PE fund or it's, it's some real, something that's uh, a Reg D, for instance, that's labeled that way. Just because it's fractional, does it mean that we can sell it to retail? So the, both those questions aimed at me, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, Emmanuel, so I, I agree with you. If, if to, to, for something that's just fractionalized to actually be taken up, there needs to be a market on it. And a lot of these projects that, that, that we get approached on, on, let's look at fractionalizing something. When you actually start digging into it, there's a lot of legal challenges and commercial challenges, right? So for example, let's say it's a hard asset and you know, you fractionalize it and you sell it to a group of investors and there's something that that asset requires an investment. For example, an insurance event or the asset gets damaged. So you need to go out to all that market of holders and say, well, who's going to pay for it? And what happens if, say, 90% pay and 10% doesn't, right? How do we deal with that? So there's all these conversations. Let's fractionalize art. Let's do these things. Okay, well, so if you fractionalize art as an investment, you know, where is it going to sit? Who's going to actually enjoy it, right? There's, there's a lot of these kind of conversations going on. And when you actually dig into the detail, the, the actual legal infrastructure around it hasn't been, and commercial, it's not just legal, because we, we basically hear what you have to say, what you want to do and build it. It hasn't actually been developed yet. I'm not saying it won't. I think there's a massive opportunity. It just, it's going to develop over time. The same way you, if you have a look at a bond issue, if there's ever an event, there's all these meeting provisions on what happens, who calls a meeting, what happens, what's the majority, et cetera. What is the consequences for holders if certain things happen, right? So we need to go through that for these new asset classes. And that's just an ongoing process. That's why I'm more bullish on existing, you know, debt security type instruments and equity securities becoming digitized, mm. right? Yeah, because there's already the existing technology and rules around that. Now, in terms of your second question around the regulator, um, you know, the, the way the regulators are, if you actually look at the FCA's guidance um, here in the UK, they're going to look at the actual product that you're, that you're talking about and say, well, is it a security? In which case, if it's a security, does it have the qualities of a security? We've created a table based on their guidance on like what are the elements that they're looking for to determine whether a particular asset is a security or not. Um, and then if it is the security, Emmanuel, it's going to be treated in exactly the same way. It doesn't mean that retail can just go and buy it, right? You're going to have the same rules and, 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 and um, protections apply to that. Mm -hmm. Now, you see with the, with the um, EU uh, sort of strategy um, that came out 24th of September that Angie mentioned, they're trying to deal with other asset classes that don't fall within current categories of securities and trying to sort of create a framework around it. And, you know, we're 18 to 24 months away 
from that actually becoming, you know, law. And a lot can happen over the next two years. So God knows how it's actually going to really look like uh, by the time it actually becomes legislation. Um, but looking at it, you know, the, the, it, they're starting to talk about rules, for example, for an issuer of digital assets where it might have some requirements in terms of regulatory capital, what it actually issues, even if it's not a security, something that's going to look like more like a prospectus. That increases barriers for the smaller fintechs that want to come in as well. So there's some advantages to the regulation because you know where you stand, but you've got to be careful you don't end up killing off the innovation because the small guys, they don't have the resources to do all of that early on. So it's a fine balance, I would say. So you've really got this world of digital assets and can we fractionalize assets? And if you can, have you got distribution or does anybody yes. want to invest in it? Buy it. What, what are you buying? Because it sounds great. It sounds great, Anthony. Oh, I'm yeah. buying a fractional part of a Lamborghini. Okay. What does that mean? Does that mean I drive it on Saturday? What if I smash it? What are the other fractional holders going to say? Right? So, so, yeah. so. There's a lot of thinking that needs to happen on that. We're not there yet. I'm sure we'll get there. I think right? when we get there on the asset side, uh, my wife's actually a professional violinist and I'm thinking I'm going to fractionalize her violin. I'll, I'll right. sell off a violin, but we keep the violin and she'll come and play for you occasionally. Okay. So there's, the, there's the asset side. But, <laughs> but then as you say, you've got what are securities. So you look at private companies and, and digital securities in that space, whether it's equity or debt. And you yep. say, well, are these assets people want to invest in? Well, People seem to want to invest in SpaceX, right? Uh, and these other fantastic high growth private companies. And if we can provide an environment where they can, you can get the distribution, then you've got really attractive assets you're bringing to uh, an investor base that maybe don't have that access, right? Am I hundred percent. That kind, that I'm very bullish on that, right? Where we're actually opening um, uh, the opportunity for investment to things that people don't get access to, right? That's why I'm very excited about the Fin P2P project right nice plug there for our big in open industry initiative um i think i can't believe time ran down so fast i thought we've got ages and now, now we've just got a by the way anthony i'll send you my swiss bank account details for for making that statement at the end of this call <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah, no, no comment but uh, i think you know i think if you're listening to us thank you for coming over to the digital securities track i might be biased but i think this is the right place to be right because um, this is where the rubber hits the road in terms of the larger financial services industry making uh, this real at scale, right? And uh, enabling distribution to happen uh, globally and uh, uh, help our economies, right? Absolutely. Um, any last words, uh, Emmanuel Angie? Uh, I, I think this has been a really excellent panel. I want to thank uh, Angie and Abradat and obviously yourself for inviting me, including me. Uh, I had, had a lot of fun. Thank you. No, likewise. Thanks to all of you. I hope people listening have found it interesting. Uh, don't go away, as they say. I'm sure we've uh, got some fantastic... I'm loving the adverts in the summer, the summer the Itaro adverts. Um, they're really cool. Uh, so we'll take a short break. And then uh, I think we've got some interesting further insights into things like uh, digital shares classes and uh, how uh, you can actually get liquidity into some of these uh, large private companies. All right. Thank you for listening and bye for now. Thank you.